Um, so thank you very much, Lisa. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of the event today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm here to talk about the role of imagery in everyday life. Um, and in my everyday life, I'm a, a researcher and clinician. I work with people with psychosis and I predominantly, but not exclusively, use cognitive behavioural approaches um, to understand the difficulties that the people I work with face and think about how we can use them to improve their quality of life. And I'm particularly influenced by um, ideas around how imagery might play a role in our well-being. And that's what I'd really like to think about with you today, to, in the hope that it might maybe contribute to your own thinking about imagery um, and the role perhaps that it plays for us in our daily life. So, what do I mean by imagery? Well, the definition of imagery has been very much disputed um, over time, um, but as a cognitive behaviour researcher and also just as a person, this definition makes a lot of sense to me and has uh, resonance. So, Koslin et al defined imagery as the experience of seeing with the mind's eye, hearing with the mind's ear and so on. So we're not just referring to visual imagery here, although that is the most widely studied, but also imagery in terms of our uh, taste, smells uh, and physical sensations as well. Um, and really this kind of definition of imagery, I think, speaks to and tells us about how essentially internal mental imagery is a kind of quasi-perceptual experience. So it has a sense of reality to it, which then raises some really interesting questions about, well, what's the difference and what are the similarities between imagery and perception, which is something that researchers have really been um, trying to think about and understand. So, um, just to try and bring this to life a bit, um, fortunately this should be relatively straightforward to do um, because the evidence suggests that, broadly speaking, we can all imagine. We all have the capacity to have mental imagery. Um, so just to kind of illustrate to you what this mental imagery might be like then, if I were to ask you to look at this picture of a lemon and imagine taking a really long, slow bite into it, or perhaps smelling this freshly cooked bacon, or maybe taking a stroll over this grass and feeling the sensation of the grass beneath your feet. Or perhaps instead maybe taking a walk or a nice gentle stroll down this beach, feeling the sound beneath your toes and, and feeling the warmth of the sun on you. Now my guess is that at least some of you would have had, to an extent, even if it's just, I can see a few nods there, even if it's just a very slight or mild experience, an internal image of perhaps the sharpness of the lemon as you bite into it, or the smell or the sensation of, of the sand or the grass under your feet. So from this perspective, and I very much agree with um, Pablo Picasso's um, uh, quote, where he said that everything you can imagine is real. Um, I feel like I'm on potentially shaky ground getting into the nature of reality in a room with lots of philosophers in it. Um, but nonetheless, just on a kind of uh, a basic kind of uh, phenomenological level, those internal images that we have have a sense of reality about them. And I think the kind of... Um, uh, the importance of imagery is very much kind of highlighted by the fact that it's been thought about and written about um, throughout history. So um, again, I uh, feel like I might need to be corrected by the philosophers in the room. Please do step in if I've got the wrong end of a stick. But um, Plato, as I understand it, wrote about imagery um, and he viewed images as being deceptions of external form. So he was there kind of tapping into and noticing the differences between perception and imagery. Um, Aristotle, in what I think is a striking kind of parallel to cognitive behavioural science today, thought that imagery was very central to a memory and thought. Um, fascinatingly, in ancient Rome, uh, they used a, a memory aid or a, a kind of a memory mnemonic called the method of Loki, which is still used today, in order to support their oratory or their public speaking. So they would imagine uh, an internal space or a location, or sorry, they would imagine a place or a location, and, uh, and then imagine a route around that place, which they would memorise with certain symbols or kind of tokens at points along the route. And so in order to remember their speech, they just had to mentally Retract, uh, uh, recount the route in order to remember the order of the points that they wanted to make. 
Um, it's interesting that in the kind of late 19th and early 20th century, there was what we might kind of view as a fall of the interest of I imagery um, around the time of um, uh, behaviorism kind of becoming more popular. There were lots of questions asked about, well, actually, you know, can we really objectively and empirically assess imagery because it requires so much introspection? Um, fortunately, I think since the um, sort of late 20th century, there's been a resurgence of interest in imagery and the role that it plays in our well-being, and that's been particularly supported by cognitive neuroscience and some of the new methodologies we have available to um, investigate imagery. Another area which I think kind of points to the importance of imagery for us as um, uh, people is that we know that images occur cross-culturally. However, what's interesting is that the meaning we ascribe to them seems to very much vary depending on the cultural context. So, um, uh, for example, in some uh, religions or in some cultural groups, imagery in the form of spirits or hearing voices might have a particular meaningful role in terms of social cohesion and, and marking transitions, whereas those similar kinds of experiences occurring perhaps in a Western culture might be interpreted very differently and as a sign of mental illness. So we know that culture is quite likely, on the one hand, the sort of cross-cultural work demonstrates that imagery is ubiquitous and therefore likely to be important for us all, but at the same time that it's subjective and the, <coughs> the meaning we ascribe to it will vary. Um, and a really nice example of that that I like is um, uh, by Giacano, um, who uh, writes about how he visited a little Philippine island, uh, Philippine island um, and he found that the people that lived there could see um, sort of fair, what they described as being like fairy-like spirits in the trees. He couldn't see these spirits, of course, um, and so apparently they all felt very sorry for him because of that, because he didn't get the opportunity to experience these lovely fairies. Um, so why do we imagine then? If we know that kind of it is common, um, what functions might it serve? So I'd like to suggest to you four possibilities. Maybe imagery helps us to feel, to experience and cope with our emotions, to remember our past, to experience for present and also to take care of our future. So, um, uh, Emily Holmes, um, who's based now at Cambridge, and her research group over the last sort of 10 to 15 years have done a lot of um, uh, empirical um, experiments looking at the impact of imagery on emotion. And what they found is, for example, if we ask people to say, into their, say in their heads the phrase, the sky is grey, compared to imagining a picture of the sky being grey, the picture is likely to have more of an impact on their mood. Similarly, to put it another way, if, I, if we were to ask people to imagine a blue sky compared to just saying the phrase, the sky is blue in your heads, that the picture of a blue sky is more likely to improve your mood um, than just reading the statement, the sky is blue. So we know then that mental imagery has an impact on emotion. Um, and interestingly, and it's sort of unsurprising, it seems to involve similar neuropsychological processes um, as what are involved in perception. So that kind of harks back to, <coughs> as we said earlier, it kind of it really is a quasi-perceptual quasi experience. And importantly, perhaps imagery can have a greater impact on emotion than verbal form. And so that's really helpful for us as people and as clinicians in terms of thinking about how can we best support people um, to, and improve their well-being. Uh, imagery is also really critical, um, we know, to our sense of self because it's our autobiographical memory is at least partly uh, image-based. Image it allows us to organise ourselves in time, so to know um, what experiences we had at points through life. It allows us to remember specific events, so when I, as I do regularly, lose my phone, I'm able to mentally trace back, well, when did I ha last have it and what was I doing? And the fact that that's an imaginal system enables it to be much richer and for me to really be able to um, trace back what I did. But we also know that um, images in the form of memory can be disrupted. So um, Sam touched on uh, post-traumatic stress and voices. Um, it's an area that I'm particularly interested in. So my clinical role, I run a post-traumatic stress and psychosis clinic. Um, and what we know is that people who have experienced different kinds of traumatic events, so childhood victimization, different types of abuse, may be particularly vulnerable to experiencing intrusive, very vivid, intense 
um, uh, moments, often the worst moments of trauma that come back to them out of the blue. And particularly in the context of psychosis, perhaps might also, as Sam kind of touched on, not necessarily recognise a link between um, the intrusion they're experiencing and their pri prior experience of trauma, potentially because the memory encoding has been so disrupted. Um, Imagery can also help us to make sense of ourselves. So we know that in terms of internal mood states, for example, people often have images associated with them. So this is a picture uh, or a piece done by Josephine uh, McKerney, who's an artist, service user um, and clinician herself. And here the blue represents depression and the red a sense of excitement. And uh, this is her sort of uh, expressing her <coughs> internal imagery of in turn the depression being kind of kept at bay, a sense of excitement growing. Um, um, and the depression being at a distance over a period of time relative to the excitement. Um, so given the, the fact that we know that we have kind of internal images representing um, our internal state, it's no surprise then that imagery content and our response to images can sometimes shape distress and plays a role in mental health problems. So for example, in social anxiety, it's very common for people to have an image of the self doing something particularly shaming that's going to um, uh, be associated or cause some form of rejection. In obsessive compulsive disorder, we know that people tend to have, or obsessive compulsive difficulties, very um, intrusive, uh, frequent thoughts that are ego dystonic so they don't fit with arguably um, what they want or what they value so for example uh, having uh, an intrusion of a child being killed or hurting someone in some way and we know that in, in uh, those kinds of difficulties people are particularly likely to feel responsible for their intrusions and to believe that they might be coming true in real life and so that causes distress and then people feel um, that they have to engage in some sort of behavior in an attempt to neutralize the intrusion and that's where the compulsive behavior comes in so it's both the content but also the beliefs about and the response to the image in, in that situation that's problematic um, in generalised anxiety, actually interesting the sort of reverse is true, but we know that people who worry a lot, I'm a bit of a worrier myself, so I can kind of emphasise with this, empathise with this, um, tend to experience more of a reduction in imagery, actually. So perhaps as we, uh, we know there's individual differences in our experience of imagery, but people who worry a lot, they may be particularly less likely to experience internal imagery. And in terms of psychosis, the area I work in, we know that hallucinations and um, certain kinds of unusual usual beliefs um, are particularly likely to be associated with images, whether memory-based or images occurring in the here and now. Thinking about some of the more helpful aspects of imagery, though, we know that imagery can help us to learn. So um, this study uh, was done where they asked people to um, <coughs> mentally rehearse doing an exercise on the piano. Um, they'd not had any, I don't think they'd played the piano previously. And what they found is that the people who had mentally rehearsed it actually performed better when it came to doing the exercise in real life. Um, and it seems as though, or what the authors concluded, was that there's something about mentally rehearsing um, in action that actually lays down um, similar neuropsychological processes that are involved in the early stages of motor skill learning that if you were going to do it in objective reality. Um, and so this is something that's used widely. We can use it to help kind of improve our performance in things. So in sports psychology, very extensively used this idea of mental imagery. Um, so people like Mo Farah, when he did his amazing Olympic performance, I would imagine that he probably has done some form of mental imagery, mental rehearsal exercises as part of his training. Um, <coughs> And what we know from that research is that what's particularly helpful is that we need to focus on strategies when we're doing the imaginal rehearsal, not the outcome. So for example, if I was trying to imaginally rehearse my talk today and hope that it might go okay, it wouldn't be much good me focusing on the outcome and sitting at home relaxing afterwards. It's actually about me trying to practice it through in my head and then I'm more likely to hopefully do okay. Um, 
So, given all this importance of imagery then, it's no wonder that imagery has been widely used in the psychotherapies. Um, so there's reports of imagery being used in shamanic healing practices dating back at least 20,000 years. And imagery is used widely across the psychotherapeutic disciplines. Um, so gestalt and psychodynamic therapies in terms of, say, empty chair type techniques, systemic therapy in terms of narrative therapy and externalizing a problem and creating a visual image of, of it. Obviously, the arts therapies across all the modalities, so art, music, dance, drama, um, imagery, the expression and modification of imagery is the tool by which those um, therapies work. And cognitive behaviour therapy, which possibly might not necessarily be viewed as uh, sort of originating from a very imagery focused place. Actually, Beck, the originator of um, CBT, did much of his early research around dreams um, and, and the role of dreams in depression. Um, and he kind of highlighted in his early writings the potential role of imagery in emotional distress. And as we've said, as I've said, the kind of cognitive neuroscience work in, in recent years has really led to an increased focus on imagery, and this has been kind of paralleled by developments within the talking CBT therapies um, in terms of compassionate mind therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that all view imagery as being really important. So, um, just to finish off then, to give you a little flavour of how we might use uh, an imagery-based approach in, in a talking therapy. Um, and I'm going to highlight um, uh, this in relation to overcoming nightmares. So we know that sleep difficulties and nightmares are very common. Of course, they have a wide impact on, on us and our well-being. We all know what it's like to have a bad night's sleep. Um, and increasingly, there's an evidence-based <coughs> building around how we can use imagery techniques to modify nightmares, reduce the distress associated with them, and improve sleep. So I'm going to talk about someone who I call Sharifa, um, and she'd experienced in the last 10 years a number of interpersonal assaults by a kind of gang on her estate. Um, and she had PTSD in relation to this um, and was experiencing nightmares about three to four times a week. Um, so very distressing for her. And the worst moments of the nightmare was this image of a gang, gang standing over her. Um, and during this, she had the thoughts, the meaning was, they're going to kill me and I've got no control. So she would wake from these nightmares, understandably feeling very scared and distressed. So what we did was we used the uh, nightmare rescripting protocols that have been developed, did psychoeducation about imagery in her <coughs> nightmares. We took a narrative of the nightmare, so what the actual image was in a lot of detail. And then we thought about, well, how can we rescript this? How can we change the meaning of the nightmare, the fact that you think you're going to die and that you've got no control to have a better outcome? And she came up with this idea of, well, actually, maybe what I can do, she didn't want to get into fighting back with the attackers because she thought she might be more harmed or that might uh, get her into more uh, danger. But she was able to recognize that actually this is just a nightmare. And from doing the imagery exercises, there's things I can do to try and change the image. So what she did, was she decided to shrink her attackers in the nightmare. And so we produced, outside of dreaming obviously, a new uh, memory rescript. She imagined it free, we recorded it, um, and she imagined the attackers getting smaller. And then over the coming weeks, <coughs> listened to that recording at home um, to really try and uh, sort of uh, reinforce that new nightmare or the new dream outcome. And she experienced a reduction in nightmare frequency and distress in the weeks following that. And she reported that during the dream, she had more of an awareness of the fact that actually I am safe now. The attackers are in the past, they can't get to me now. And I do have some control because actually I can influence what the attackers are doing to me in the dream. So um, I hope I've kind of given you a bit of a flavor, maybe encouraged you to think more about how imagery is central to our sense of well-being, um, that it shapes our past, present and future self. And perhaps most importantly, that we as uh, clinicians or therapists or the general public can make beneficial use of imagery in our day-to-day -day lives. So um, I'd like to thank uh, just some of the people I've worked with or whose work has influenced um, my ideas in the area. Um, and uh, yeah, and thank you very much for listening.